I want to pick back up in Acts chapter 5 this morning. Uh, if you missed last week because of the holiday or a tornado almost taking out your house or your neighbor's house, uh, maybe you spent the night in a storm shelter and you were just tired and didn't want to come, understand. Um, you, can, you can check out last week on the YouTube channel. Jack's been doing a, a lot of work uh, cleaning that up and making it easier to use. Um, anybody been scrolling through your reels and my beautiful face pops up? All right. Yeah. That's all Jack's handiwork, so appreciate him doing that. Well, here's where we left off last week. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they've just been buried. Uh, the apostles go out and begin to perform many signs, wonders among the people. More and more people are receiving Christ, and they are seeking healing to the point that they are laying their loved ones on, on outside on, near the street so that when Peter walks by, his shadow will cast over them, having full faith that, that God is going to heal their friends and family. Verse 16 is a really easy verse to just read over, but it, it says that uh, all of them were healed. Every single person who was on the street, as Peter walked down the street, each and every one of them were, were healed. And, and I think that that speaks to the power of, of God and, and the love that God had for this new growing church and wanting to show them that he had the power. God was moving, the people were being blessed, and they were being healed, and, and in droves they were turning their lives over to Jesus Christ. And so whenever good things are happening for, for people, um, it's, it's easy for the people who were in power before these Christians came along and, and brought Jesus' power with them, it's really easy for those people to, to be upset. They don't want to relinquish their power. And this is something that, that we have seen over and over, played out throughout history. People who are in power don't like to give up that power, and they will do whatever they have to do to keep that power. It's something that we can read about in the Old Testament, and we'll see wars started over people keeping power. Uh, we see it through the New Testament as they crucified Jesus to keep their power they, they had to have known, right? The Jews had to have known what they were doing. There's enough evidence written out through Scripture that Jesus came and fulfilled every single prophecy about the Messiah. So it was a choice to ignore who Jesus was and to go ahead and crucify him so they could hold on to their power. It's something that even continues to this day. People who are in power like to keep that power, and they will do whatever they have to do in order to keep that power. So now it's the apostles' turn to feel the wrath of those who are in charge, who want to keep this power, and they are, they are desperately trying to do anything they can to shut the disciples up, to shut the new church up, so that they can hold on to this power. And so that's where we kind of end up in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 17. And I am going to read quite a bit of scripture today because I need you to get the full picture here. But I'm going to start reading in Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest and all, the all of his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of all the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. 
The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right, to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. If we think back to a few weeks ago, we had Peter was in jail again, and they released him and just gave him a stern talking to, right? Don't go do that anymore. And he said, I'm going to go do this again, uh, and you are guilty of killing the Messiah. Fast forward, I don't know exactly the amount of time, and you've got Peter being imprisoned again, and now when he gets out, he has the same message for the people who imprisoned him. Um, they're saying, don't, don't put bl blood on my hands, right? I didn't do anything to Jesus. And he's like, no, you absolutely killed the Messiah. Doesn't change his story one bit. Richard, I'm sure that, that every church you've ever gone and visited, um, they've all received your ministry and written you huge checks and said, we love Christian prison ministries of mid-America, right? Never been told no? <laughs> we've all been told no. Uh, we've probably all been met with some sort of resistance at some time or another in our life. I had an opportunity this week to watch a movie that's coming out July 4th. Uh, it's, it's called The Sound of Hope. All right, Look it up. Google it. Um, it's going to be a fantastic film, but it's all about this small town in East Texas called Possum Trot, and this small town, this small town church, it decides to do something about the orphan crisis, and, and orphans have been a crisis for all places, um, you know, we, we donate to uh, Mays County Foster or fostering Mays County, uh, because there is a need. And, and there are people who are in the system, who stay in the system, who bounce around home to home, never truly get what they need out of a family. And this small church decides to do something about this problem. In total, 22 families adopted 77 children and ended the crisis. At, at the end of the movie, I'll, I'll spoil it for you because it really doesn't matter, you need to see it. The guy who started this entire movement calls the, the DHS office and says, hey, we're ready for more kids. And she says, there are no more kids. People thought that they were crazy. They were met with all kinds of resistance. And, and I'm going to encourage everyone in here to go see that film. But it's amazing to me that one person, if they're doing what God wants them to do, if they're following the lead of the Holy Spirit, they can change the world. These apostles who were in prison, they had an opportunity, they had a choice. They could either shut up and not get beaten and, and potentially killed, or they could do what God was asking them to do. They could continue to spread the message of Jesus Christ. They could not care about what humans say, and they could listen to what God says. And so out of an obedience to God, just like what Richard's doing, just like this church in Possum Trot, Texas, just like Peter and the other apostles, when they listen to God rather than to humans, God leads them into places that they never really probably expected to be. Whenever these disciples were walking with Jesus, whenever they were, were healing people in towns and, and, you know, we just talked about feeding the 5,000 on Wednesday night, whenever these miraculous things are happening, they probably didn't fully expect to be persecuted only a few short years later. How many good things are not done because people refuse to obey God? 
How many times has God wanted us to do something great, but we have been unwilling to follow where he's taking us out of fear? Evil has always tried to silence good. This isn't a, a new problem that we face this day and age. We can read about it in the Bible right here, where evil is trying to silence the work of Christ. People have tried for over 2,000 years to discount Christianity, to tell us that we were crazy, to, to say that it, you know, it's not real. People have tried to keep Jesus out of government, out of schools, out of jails, out of businesses, and out of the hearts of other people. And as hard as they try, here we are 2,000 years later, and Jesus Christ is still alive and well. The message of the gospel is still being spread to places where it was formerly kept out. Uh, we're going to get to hear from Charlie Spencer in a few weeks and, and places in India and Lebanon and all around the world where the gospel is still being shared, even though... There's people around who would rather that not be the case. Time after time, people put in this work, and when it gets too hard, they give up. We can't give up. It seems like in this world we live in now, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? If you are loud enough, if, if you are bold enough, if you keep saying whatever it is you're saying, people will do whatever they have to do to shut you up. And oftentimes the loudest voice in the room is not the most popular one. But because of people not wanting to face a problem, they'll quiet whatever that squeaky wheel is. About 15 years ago, prior schools, baccalaureate was held in the Avra, it probably wasn't even called the Avra back then, but in the auditorium. And, and Every year, that's where we would have it. Until this group called Freedom From Religion decided to threaten the school with a lawsuit for having a Christian service on their campus. And you know, with, with Christian school board, school board members in place and, and with a Christian community, I really expected the school to kind of put up a fight against that. Because majority of the students there, majority of the families who support the school are Christians. But instead of putting up a fight, instead of standing for what was right, instead of caring about tradition and the way we've always done it, and it's a good thing, they decided just to move the service off campus. And it's been off campus ever since. They allowed the loud voice, that, that squeaky wheel, to control or dictate the choices that they made instead of standing up for what was right. They allowed the voice of human beings and the obedience to human beings overcome their obedience to God. The apostles didn't care if they were persecuted. They didn't care if they were flogged, which we're going to read here in a minute. They didn't care if it cost them their lives to stand up for what mattered, and that was Jesus Christ. Peter's words were so true, and they, they are still true today. We must obey God rather than human beings. You know, Southside is a, is a proud partner with the Christian ministries of Mid-America because barriers are being broken down. We're seeing people's lives being changed for Jesus Christ. And people in these jail cells are there because they made a bad decision and they got caught. There's a lot of people who make bad decisions who never end up behind bars. And each and every one of them, whether they got caught and they're in a jail cell or they didn't get caught and they're sitting in the congregation today, they're all in need of a Savior. And so whether... Richard has to go into a, a jail, into a prison to find that person who has made bad decisions and needs a savior or whether that person is sitting here every Sunday and I'm preaching to you, it's the same savior that both people need. So what is that area of your life that you bend to the pressure of society instead of obeying Christ? 
Have you made compromises in order to keep somebody quiet? In order to, to have a in order to not have to face up to some sort of fight in your life, do you just ignore certain things? Some of the best advice my mom ever gave me, probably the only advice I ever listened to that she gave me, was we need to choose our battles, right? Everything doesn't, doesn't get to be fought about. If you don't ignore some things, right, you're going to be just constantly fighting. But when it comes to the ways of Jesus, when it comes to obedience to Jesus Christ, those battles are worth fighting. Had the disciples not done this, had they not stood up to uh, the Sadducees, if they had not stood up to the chief priests, I don't think we'd be sitting here today. Christianity would look so much different if it wasn't non-existent. So whether imprisoned or punished, they would not be stopped. They would spread the truth of Jesus Christ no matter the cost. I think following Jesus requires us to be bold in the face of adversity. I know that nobody likes conflict, right? I don't think there's probably somebody in the room that's going to be like, oh, I love conflict. Uh, conflict is stressful, right? We like a, a just nice, happy life where we don't have to be conflicted. And I think that there is a lot of areas, a lot of places, a lot of instances where that is the best choice, is to live at peace with all men, right? Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So if it's up to me, I want to live at peace with everyone. But we can't ignore Paul's words at the beginning of that. If it is possible, I think that's extremely sound advice, but when it comes to the way of Christ, when it comes to the gospel, you can't be silenced because it is more important to be at peace with God than it is to be at peace with men. We have to follow Jesus. Sometimes that is going to cause conflict. For Peter here, it's causing a huge conflict to the point where he is put in jail again, and we're about to read what happens to him. The apostles were obviously not living at peace with the Sadducees. The members of the Sanhedrin hated them. They wanted to just get rid of them. They wanted to silence them. They were breaking their direct orders. And so for that reason, they stood up and they said, you know what, it's not about your rules. It's not about what you tell me to do. The person I answer to is God and God alone. And the cool thing about God's plan, it is completely unstoppable. Um, God's going to get done what God wants to get done. And he's either going to get it done through you or he's going to get it done through somebody else who is willing to follow. So here's what happens in Acts chapter 5, verse 32 through 42. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin in order that the men be put, and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, uh, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody for about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in, had them flogged. Then they ordered them to not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. 
How often are we scared to step up and do something huge for the kingdom? Even non-believers, like Gamaliel, knew that God could not be stopped. He didn't know for sure if these men were who they said they were and if Jesus was who he said he was, but he knew for sure that God wouldn't be stopped. And so either let this thing fizzle out or you're going to find yourself in a fight against God. We know that Jesus is the way, right? We know that Jesus is is still alive. And we know that people still live in fear even though Jesus is alive and well. So how do we reach those people? How do we reach those people who live in fear? We can't do it by being silenced. We have to step out in faith. Gamaliel was explaining that that many have come before and tried to start a revolution. It's not like Peter and the apostles were anything new, anything special. And they all had failed. Well, here we are 2,000 years later, showing that they weren't wrong. That the disciples were telling the truth. That Jesus is exactly who they said that he was. As long as there are Christians refusing to be silenced growth of the kingdom will continue to happen. As long as there are people willing to take the word of God into places where no one else is willing, Jesus' fame will continue to grow. So as we take Jesus into our workplace, into our families, into our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? As long as we are willing to do that, the growth of the church will be completely unstoppable. As it continues to go into jail cells, as it continues to go into your schools, which are a whole lot alike, mind you. (laughs) It's only when we stop telling others about Jesus Christ that the church will fail. God's plan was for the apostles to start the church. If they got locked in jail, he just let them out. If they they got beaten, they didn't care. They still continued to share the message. God sets us free to be able to go and do those things. We are only held back by ourselves. I mean, to see that God set them free with doors locked and guards still standing, I don't know how he did it. It's pretty impressive, though. Do you have things in your life that keep you from sharing God with others? Do you feel like you're trapped in a jail cell with guards outside and you just feel like, I cannot share in this place? You need to know that God's plan is unstoppable. God will not be stopped. Every roadblock to our faith, every single one, Jesus Christ overcomes. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. And and I I want to focus on this point just for a second. They had counted the cost. They knew what they were up against. They'd already been arrested before. They'd been threatened. They didn't care. And so this time, they're arrested, and they go one step further. Flogged. You know, I love that word, flogged. It sounds brutal. Um... And really, flogging sometimes killed people. It was a brutal beating. And so as they're beaten, I mean, they use this word rejoicing, okay? And, and stay with me here. How many times do you just have a bad day? And you're like, I'm not very joyful today. It's just been a bad day. <clears throat> you know, my... Anybody who came to my graduation party for Carver knows that my house flooded a few weeks ago. We have no flooring. Um, the house is in shambles. Got a wall cut out. Uh, just it's kind of it's kind of messy, and I I can't really say I'm joyful about that, right? <laughs> can't really say I'm joyful about that. I think my wife is probably less joyful about that. <clears throat> There's things that happen in our life that, that we're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not very joyful today. Uh, I was not tearing out floor 
on a Saturday night at 8 o'clock three weeks ago and just thinking, no, this is great. Turn on the Christian music and let's get to work. Okay? That wasn't how it was. I think there's things that happen in each and every one of our lives every single week when we're like, I am not real joyful today. If you were imprisoned and then beaten, I mean, I'm not raising my hand. I'm not going to be very joyful about that. These guys, these apostles, it didn't matter if they were arrested. It didn't matter if they were beaten within an inch of their life. They were still going to be joyful because the reason that they were going through this stressful time in their life was because of their faith in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. We have to stop being soft in our Christianity. I think we are way too easily swayed by, you know, just things that are happening, by consequences of life, by by just our everyday life, we get down. These guys endured so much more than we will ever endure. I hope. I don't know. We've still got a lot of years, and this country is kind of crazy, so we'll see. But I think that they endured more than we will ever endure in our lifetime, and yet they were still joyful. So it's up to us. Are we going to choose God's plan? Are we going to choose to be a part of that plan? Are we going to choose to be joyful even in the midst of that plan? Or are we going to fall to the pressures of the world? Are we going to stop listening to the voice of God and begin to listen to the voice of man that says, well, if you'll just do this over here, then you won't be persecuted over there. If, you, if you'll just do this over here to make your life so much easier, but that over there goes directly against God. There's an amazing thing about the Christian church. The Christian church thrives in times of persecution. Whenever the church is persecuted, when they tried to get rid of the church, when they tried to get rid of the apostles, thousands more people showing up right behind them saying, you know what, I'm going to follow. Because there's no way you would do what you're doing if Jesus Christ wasn't real. I think the church thrives in difficult situations. We see people gather in to help whenever there's a need. Christian people are the worst volunteers if there's not a need, right? I don't show up to the church on Monday morning and have people waiting at the door saying, hey, what can I do? I'm just dying to serve this week. But as soon as there's a need, as soon as something happens, people jump in to help immediately. And I think that that is exactly the situation. As soon as things started getting ugly, as soon as things started getting stressful, people are like, you know what? I went in on that. Even though I'm seeing these people being persecuted, I still want to follow Jesus. We need to be a part of God's unstoppable plan. It's going to go on whether we're in it or not. So we might as well come alongside and enjoy where God takes us. Richard, I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to continue the work that you're doing. Um, just based upon what you said and, and seeing and talking to you, you know, on the phone. And um, I know that you are making a difference in these people's lives. And so we do stand behind you in prayer. Uh, we do stand behind you as you take the gospel into those hard-to-reach prisons. I really can't imagine how hardened hearts could be in a prison. And yet you're still finding a way and finding people who are open to the message of Jesus Christ. We're all in need of a Savior. Every human being is in need of a Savior. So whether they're locked up behind bars, whether they're in another country, no matter where they're at, they're all in need of Jesus Christ. I know that you are truly a part of God's unstoppable plan. And I know that there's a lot of other people who are also a part of God's unstoppable plan. My challenge this morning is that each of us would find that, that niche, that place that God wants us to be and join with Jesus to be a part 
of God's unstoppable plan. Will you pray with me? Lord, we love you. And God, I know that you've placed different people in different roles in this world. But each of them are important. So Lord, whether that is taking care of children or, or working at a plant or going into prisons and, and speaking truth, Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts and minds to, to be receptive to the things you're leading us to. And God, as we encounter different people throughout the week, Lord, I just pray that we will we'll be bold for you that we won't take our, our Christianity lightly, but that we will choose to be a part of this unstoppable plan that you put in motion from the beginning of the world. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.